belief. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under the Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sin, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. So today's passage will be coming from the Gospel of Matthew from 27 to 44. Jesus is mocked. Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the governor's headquarters, and they gathered the whole battalion for him, and they stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him. And twisting together a crown of thorns, they put it on his head and put a reed in his right hand. And, and kneeling before him, they mocked him, saying, Hail, King of Jews! And they spit on him and took the reed and struck him on the head. And when they had mocked him, they stripped him of the robe and put his own clothes on him and led him away to crucify him. As they went out, they found a man of Cyrene, Simon by name. They compelled this man to carry his cross. And when they came to a place called Gothga, which means place of a skull, they offered him wine to drink mixed with a gall. But when he tasted it, he would not drink it. And when they had crucified him, they divided his garments among them by casting lots. Then they sat down and kept watch over him there. And over his head, they put the charge against him, which reads, This is Jesus, the king of the Jews. Then two robbers were crucified with him, one on the right and one on the left. And those who passed by derided him, wagging their heads and saying, You who destroyed the temple and rebuilt it in three days, save yourself. If you are the Son of God, come down from the cross. So also the chief priests with the scribes and elders mocked him, saying, He saved others, he cannot save himself. He is the King of Israel, let him come down now from the cross, and we will believe in him. He trusts in God, let God deliver him now, if he desires him. For he said, I am the Son of God, and the robbers who were crucified with him also reviled him in the same way. This is the word of God for the people of God. It will be my honor to invite up our guest preacher today, a brother, David. So a little information about David is he's a member of a New Hyde Baptist Church, which is the same church as Micah McCormick, who preached a, a few months ago. So he has a very unique background in serving, in serving the Lord. So he did go to school for dance performance and works as a dancer for an off-Broadway show, Sleep No More. And then, but even greater for this passion for dance, he has a passion to share the word and preach it to, to the people of God. So help me welcome our brother David to join us today. Testing, can you guys hear me? Well, good afternoon. <laughs> good afternoon. As you can tell, I look very different from all of you, but if you're in Christ, if you are a Christian, we're all family. And uh, it's a beautiful thing to see and experience just how big and diverse God's family is. And um, I don't know any of you personally, but I do believe that you guys are my brothers and sister in Christ. And if the Lord loves you, I love you. And hopefully you guys love me too. And uh, it is a joy for me to bring you uh, his word today. Uh, before I begin, as you guys know, my name is David Parker. And I'm getting married in literally one week from today. So, yeah. 
Sorry, ladies. Um, <laughs> I'm 27 years old. I'm from Long Island, New York. And uh, even though I grew up in church, I didn't get saved until I was about 22 years old. And I'm currently a part-time intern at New Hyde Park Baptist Church, where Micah McCormick is from. And I'm also a part-time performer, um, just as just mentioned. It's an off-Broadway show, Sleep No More. And uh, yeah, I went to school for dance, and I love to perform, and I have a great love for the Word of God. Am I going to be a pastor? Am I going to continue in dancing? I don't know. Uh, the secret things belong to the Lord. And, uh, but anyway, it's a joy for me to be here today. This morning, I have the great privilege to speak about the Lord Jesus Christ. On one hand, it is a joy to speak about a Savior who came to save sinners like you and me. But on the other hand, it is a great burden, because without the Spirit, our hearts and minds cannot comprehend in the slightest bit the wonder of wonders. Without the Spirit, our hearts and our minds are darkened to the things of Scripture. So my prayer is that as we consider our passage today, that the Holy Spirit will be at work in our hearts, and that we will be able to behold something more of the beauty of the Lord Jesus. And as a result of that, we would be all the more stirred to worship Him as Lord and King of our lives. So please join me in a brief moment of prayer. Lord, thank you for today. Thank you for the Church of Grace, the Fujinis. Thank you for this opportunity that I now have to present to them your word. Lord, it is my prayer that your people may be edified, that I would be edified. And Lord, we ask that you would sanctify us, sanctify us by your truth. Your word is truth. In my weakness, Lord, please help me to preach the Lord Jesus. Help me to preach for your name's sake. Amen. If you have a Bible with you, turn with me to Matthew 27. This is towards the very end of the gospel. And in our passage today, we are met with the crucifixion of the Lord Jesus Christ. And as we dive into our passage today, we're going to consider four things. Number one, the place of the crucifixion. Number two, the person of the crucifixion. Number three, an underlying principle of the crucifixion. And number four, the paradox of the crucifixion. So I'm going to read our passage just one more time. I'm reading from the CSB Bible, starting with verse 27. Then the governor's soldiers took Jesus into the governor's residence and gathered the whole company around him. They stripped him and dressed him in a scarlet robe. They twisted together a crown of thorns, put it on his head, and placed a staff in his right hand. And they knelt down before him and mocked him. Hail! king of the Jews. Then they spat on him, took the staff, and kept hitting him on the head. After they had mocked him, they stripped him of the robe, put on his clothes, on his own clothes, on him, and led him away to crucify him. As they were going out, they found a Cyrenian man named Simon. They forced him to carry his cross. When they came to a place called Golgotha, which means place of the skull, they gave him wine mixed with gold to drink. But when he tasted it, he refused to drink it. After crucifying him, they divided his clothes by casting lots. Then they sat down and were guarding him there. Above his head, they put up the charge against him in writing, This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Then two criminals were crucified with him, one on the right and one on the left. Those who passed by were yelling insults at him, shaking their heads and saying, You who would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself. If you are the Son of God, come down from the cross. In the same way, the chief priests, with the scribes and elders, mocked him and said, He saved others, but he cannot save himself. He is the King of Israel. Let him come down from the cross, and we will believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God rescue him now, if he takes pleasure in him. For he said, I am the Son of God. In the same way, even the criminals who crucified him taunted him. As I just mentioned a few moments ago, we are near the very end of Matthew. And this brings me to my first point. 
the place of the crucifixion. I'd like us to consider the place of the crucifixion in the larger literary context first. Our Bibles today are made up of 66 books, and as you read through those books, you will realize that there are different genres. You have narrative. We have examples of that in Genesis and Exodus. There's poetry. We see that in the Psalms. And we have wisdom, Job's and uh, Proverbs. And the genre that our passage is found in today is a gospel account. And the New Testament opens with four different gospel accounts. Now, a gospel is not exactly a biography. It is not exactly a chronological story. But rather, a gospel is a collection of small episodes that centers around one main character. And that main character of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John is the Lord Jesus Christ. And even though you're met with these episodes of who Jesus is as you read through the Gospels, there is one important detail to notice. And that detail is this. The crucifixion is always at the end of each Gospel. And that is what I want us to keep in mind as we look at our passage today. The fact that the crucifixion is placed at the end helps us to see that everything that came before was mainly to lead us to this very moment. Everything that Matthew wrote about concerning the Lord Jesus before this event will now start to reach its climax. It is the end of the life of Jesus that helps us to make sense of his beginning. There's not only importance in the literary place of the crucifixion, but there's also much importance in the geographical place as well. Look with me at verse 33. When they came to a place called Golgotha, which means place of the skull. The exact place of Golgotha, which means Calvary in Latin, is not as clear when reading Matthew's Gospel alone. But when we take into the other Gospel accounts, we have a much picture of where Golgotha is. Listen to these words from Mark 15, verses 20 and verse 22. After they had mocked him, they stripped him of the purple robe and put his clothes on him. They led him out to crucify him. They brought Jesus to a place called Golgotha, which means place of the skull. John 19, verses 16 through 17, and verse 20. Then he handed him over to be crucified. Then they took Jesus away. Carrying the cross by himself, he went out to what is called place of the skull, which is in Aramaic, is called Golgotha. Many of the Jews read this sign because the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city. Golgotha's geographical place was outside the city of Jerusalem. While this was a common place for criminals to be crucified, this place bears much importance when considering the crucifixion of the Lord Jesus. While the place of Golgotha being outside the city may seem like a small detail, there is actually a big implication to see. And just to give a little hint, the reason why Matthew is writing in the first place is that he wants the readers to see that Jesus Christ is the fulfillment of all that the Old Testament prophesied. In the Old Testament, within some of the Levitical sacrifices, there was a part in some of the offerings where the priest had to take the sacrifice and burn it outside of the Israelite camp. Listen to these words from Exodus 29, 14. But burn the bull's flesh, its hide, and its waist outside the camp. It is a sin offering. Leviticus 16, 27. The bull for the sin offering and the goat for the sin offering whose blood was brought into the most holy place to make atonement, must be brought outside the camp in their hide, flesh, and waist burned. In the same way that these sin offerings were brought outside of the camp, we see the Lord Jesus being brought outside the city of Jerusalem as the ultimate sin offering. This is why we have these words in Hebrews 13, verse 11 and 12. For the bodies of those animals whose blood is brought into the most holy place by the high priest as a sin offering are burned outside the camp. Therefore, Jesus also suffered outside the gate so that he might sanctify the people by his own blood. 
So there are two things that we ought to take away as we've just considered the literary context and the geographical place of the crucifixion. Because the crucifixion is placed at the end of the earthly ministry of Jesus in the Gospel writings, we can conclude that Jesus came to this earth to die. But as we consider the geographical place as well, in light of what all the Old Testament foreshadows, we see that Jesus came not only to die, but he came to die as a sin offering. Point number two, the person of the crucifixion. There are a lot of people in our passage today. We have the governor's soldiers in verse 27. We have a Cyrenian man named Simon in verse 32. We have two criminals in verse 38. Chief priests, the scribes, and elders in verse 41. And I was originally going to call this section the people of the crucifixion, and I thought I would spend some time on each of the individuals. But after meditating on the passage, I thought it would just be best to focus on one person, the Lord Jesus Christ himself. Because in the end, this passage is really all about him. So as we consider the person of the crucifixion, as we consider the Lord Jesus Christ, I'm going to take us back to some snapshots that are given to us by Matthew. Matthew 1.1, 1, 1, an account of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Jesus is the bridge between the Old and the New Testament. He is from the royal line of David, and he is the long-awaited Messiah. And as Abraham was the father of national Israel, Jesus is the founder of a new spiritual Israel. Matthew 1.23, See, the virgin will become pregnant and give birth to a son, and they will name him Emmanuel, which is translated, God is with us. Jesus is the very presence of God dwelling with humanity. He is God in the flesh, for the entire fullness of God's nature dwells bodily in him. Matthew 5.17 Don't think that I came to abolish the law or the prophets. I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill. The law referring to the first five books of the Bible and the prophets referring to the rest of them. Jesus is the one that came to perfect, perfectly obey all that the law of God has commanded in the Old Testament. He is the one that did not come to replace the Old Testament, but rather he is the sure fulfillment of it. What the Old Testament foreshadows is found in Christ. And we have a clear example of this in our passage today. If you look at verse 35 with me, it reads, After crucifying him, they divided his clothes by casting lots. And then look at verse 41 to 43. In the same way, the chief priests with the scribes and elders mocked him and said, He saved others, but he cannot save himself. He is the king of Israel. Let him come down now from the cross, and we will believe in him. He trusts in God, but God rescues him now, for he takes pleasure in him. For he said, I am the son of God. Now turn with me to Psalm 22. This is a psalm that was written a thousand years before the life of the Lord Jesus. And let's look at verses 6 through 8, and then verses 16 through 18. But I am a worm, and not a man, scorned by mankind, and despised by people. Everyone who sees me mocks me. They sneer and shake their heads. He relies on the Lord. Let him save him. Let the Lord rescue him, since he takes pleasure in him. Verses 16 through 18. For dogs have surrounded me. A gang of evildoers have closed in on me. They pierced my hands and my feet. I can count all my bones. People look at, people look and stare at me. They divided my garments among themselves and they cast lots for my clothing. What David spoke about concerning himself was then later used to speak about the one greater than him. Now Jesus being the bridge between the Old and New Testament, the fulfillment, and him being the long-awaited Messiah are great truths with great implications. But I also know that it can be hard to understand what those truths really mean for us today, individually as people. 
So in addition to what I just read, I want to give you a few more snapshots of the Lord Jesus found in the Gospel of Matthew. I will be doing some more reading, but the Word of God is living and effective, sharper than any double-edged sword. So I pray that as I read these passages, the Word of God would be at work in your hearts. So just listen to these words from Matthew. Matthew 8, verses 1 through 3. When he came down from the mountain, large crowds followed him. Right away a man with leprosy came up and knelt before him, saying, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Reaching out his hand, Jesus touched him, saying, I am willing, be made clean. Immediately his leprosy was cleansed. Matthew 9, verses 10 through 12. When he was reclining at the table in the house, many tax collectors and sinners came to eat with Jesus and his disciples. When the Pharisees saw this, they asked his disciples, Why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? Now when he heard this, he said, It is not those who are well who need a doctor, but those who are sick. Go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. For I didn't come to call the righteous, but sinners. Matthew 9, verses 35 and 36. Jesus continued going around to all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and every sickness. And when he saw the crowds, he felt compassion for them, because they were distressed and dejected, like sheep without a shepherd. And lastly, Matthew 15, verses 29 through 31. Moving on from there, Jesus passed along the Sea of Galilee, he went up on a mountain and sat there, and large crowds came to him, including the lame, the blind, the crippled, those unable to speak, and many others. They put them at his feet, and he healed them. It is impossible to miss the love that the Lord Jesus had for people, and particularly for those who were considered unclean, for those who were despised by society, those who were distressed and dejected, those who were unwell. When we turn on our TV today and when we scroll through social media, you'll get to a certain point where you'll find yourself, what is going on with the world? And the simple question, and the simple answer to that question is this. The world is spiritually unclean and unwell. The world is spiritually lame, blind, and crippled. And if we are honest with ourselves, we are all spiritually lame blind, and crippled. I'm spiritually broken, and you're spiritually broken. But the person of the crucifixion, the Lord Jesus Christ, came to die for people like you and me. This is the person of the crucifixion in our passage today. The Lord Jesus Christ himself, the God-man, the friend of sinners, who was flogged, who was stripped, who was crowned with a crown of thorns, who was mocked, who was spat at and beaten with a staff, and who was crucified. The only one who ever existed that committed absolutely no wrong, humiliated at the hands of wicked men. Now one could ask, where is God in all of this? Is he just standing by twiddling his thumbs as this injustice is happening? And this leads me to our next point. An underlying principle of the crucifixion. If we want to make sense of our passage today, if we want to make sense of the crucifixion of the Lord Jesus, there is an underlying principle that we have to understand. And that principle is this. What man means for evil, God means for good. What man means for evil, God means for good. If we were to go back to the early stages of Old Testament history, we would encounter the story of a young man by the name of Joseph. Joseph was one of 12 sons, and he was a favorite by his father. And Joseph's brothers grew very jealous of him, and they envied him very much. And when they got tired of him, they decided to betray him and sell him as a slave. In addition to that, later on in his life, Joseph got falsely accused of rape and sent into jail. But fast forward many years, Joseph finds himself in a position of authority, where if he wanted to, he could have had his brothers killed. But instead of being brash and revengeful towards his brothers, we have these words from Genesis 50, 
verse 20. Joseph says to his brothers, As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good, to bring about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. In other words, when Joseph's brothers really did plan to do him wrong, they did. They made the deliberate decision to throw him into a well, to sell him into slavery, and to lie about his death to their father. But at the same time, they were not at all aware of how their actions were a part of a much bigger plan that was meant for the ultimate good. There was another planner. So when Joseph said these words, as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good, Joseph understood something profound about the sovereignty of God that must be considered in our passage today. Joseph understood that the outworking of history is not left to chance, that it's not left to the whims and wills of human beings. But in actuality, there are two planners in history. There's God and there's man. And this is what we see in our passage today. On one hand, we have the governor's soldiers who do not have the slightest bit of remorse in their actions towards Jesus. They are planning, and they are deliberately inflicting pain, scorn, and mockery. And yet, on the other hand, we have these famous words from Isaiah 53 that speak about the suffering servant. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. What the Roman soldiers meant for evil, God meant for good. On one hand, we have the chief priests, the scribes, and the elders who were trying to figure out a way to kill Jesus from the very beginning. And in our passage, we see him mocking the Lord Jesus by saying he saved others, but he cannot save himself. But on the other hand, we see in Matthew 16, verse 21, that it was necessary for Jesus to go to Jerusalem to suffer many things from the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, be killed and be raised on the third day. Because the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. What the chief priests, the scribes, and the elders meant for evil, God meant for good. Now, if this is so with the crucifixion of the Lord Jesus Christ, if the Lord is able to bring about eternal good and salvation through what seemed inhumane and downright cruel to truly the only innocent man that has ever walked the earth, how much more will the Lord make good out of the things that are wrong in this world? Things seem to be getting worse and worse. That may be true. But all things work together for good of those who love God, who are called according to His purpose. All things work together for the good. And this brings me to our last point for today. The paradox of the crucifixion. Today, you're very likely to see people wearing a gold chain of a cross or have a tattoo of it somewhere on their body. And when we look at crosses today, there's generally a positive connotation to it. But in the days of Jesus, the cross was the last thing people wanted to associate with, associate with and identify with. In the ancient world, the cross was synonymous with crucifixion. As we saw in our text today, death by way of the cross was truly the most horrible. For the Jew... You were considered cursed by God if you were crucified. Normally, after a criminal is condemned, he was to be beaten severely with whips that would leave his skin open with many gashes. And from there, the criminal would have to carry one of the beams of the cross to his execution site. And from there, he would then be stripped naked and have his hands and his feet nailed to a cross. And the criminal would be put on public display with his crime written on a sign placed above his head. Truly, there was nothing more shameful and humiliating. And yet, this is part of what the Lord Jesus Christ endured so that we might be saved. Brothers and sisters, the paradox of the crucifixion is this. It is the message of the cross. The message of cross that is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved. It is the power of God. The paradox of the crucifixion is this, is that the Lord Jesus became naked 
so that we might be clothed in righteousness. He redeemed us from the curse of the law so that we... Uh, he redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. He died for us so that we might live for him. The paradox of the crucifixion of the Lord Jesus Christ is this. Is that at Calvary, we, stand, we see man's hatred for Christ, and yet we see Christ's love for men. And this leads me to one more brief little point. A plea to look to the crucifixion. Jesus said, Greater love has no one than this, than one lay down his life for his friends. Brothers and sisters, I encourage you to look to the cross and be reminded that the Lord Jesus Christ suffered because he loved us. And he loved us not because of anything that we had to offer him, but he loved us simply because he loved us. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for sending your Son. We thank you, Lord Jesus, that you came to die for us, to die in our place. And Lord, we are so unworthy. But Lord, we recognize that you are gracious and you are so merciful. And we now want to live lives that please and glorify you, Lord God. So, Father, we ask that you would be with us. We ask, O oh Lord God, that we would hide your word in our hearts so we wouldn't sin against you. And we pray, O oh Lord God, that we would continue to be reminded of the beautiful work that Jesus Christ has done for us. In his name I pray all of this. Amen. Please rise to sing a song.